So I wanted you to talk about the Christian faith and about the wisdom of the scriptures. When the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, fame due to the name of Yahweh, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue and camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba had observed all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his valets, and his burnt offerings that he had offered at the house of Yahweh, there was no more spirit in her. So she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your accomplishments and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and with my own eyes had I seen it. Not even half that had been told me. Your wisdom and prosperity far surpass the reports that I had heard. Happy are your wives, happy are these your servants who continually attend to hear your wisdom. Blessed be Yahweh your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because Yahweh loved Israel forever, he has made you king to execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold, a great quantity of spices, and in such quantity as that which the queen of Sheba gave to the king Solomon. How far will you go to find wisdom? What are you willing to sacrifice to find wisdom? Queen Sheba is an example to us. This Old Testament story is an example to us of the importance that we must place upon finding wisdom, O oh church. Wisdom is not facts, it's not just knowledge. Wisdom is the application of learning to your life that bears fruit in your life to bring you from a lower place to a higher place. The wisdom of Solomon that he prayed for brought him to be a king of such renown that the queen of Africa, not the whole of Africa, but a queen of Africa, Queen Sheba traveled over a thousand miles to sit and to learn the wisdom of Solomon to test him with all of her questions so that she would know how things are and how things should be. And she was willing to sacrifice great time and energy and resources to find this wisdom, to sit at it and learn at it. And what is this teaching for us as Christians? It teaches us that we should value wisdom as greatly as Sheba valued the wisdom of Solomon. There is an anti-intellectualism in the church. There is a, a great number of Christians who prize themselves almost on their ignorance. They think if they just preach the gospel, if they just shout the gospel, that somehow this will speak to the world. But the scriptures teach us that we should pursue wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge applied to your life to make it better. The Bible teaches us to prize wisdom. So why is the church floundering in ignorance? Why are we not applying the lessons of sociology to the structures of the church? Why are we not applying the learning of politics to the activity of the church? Why are we not applying our learning about psychology to our evangelism? Why are we not applying our knowledge of economics to how we use our resources as the people of God? We are a people floundering in ignorance because we have bought into an anti-intellectualism amongst too many of us as Christians. A kind of simplistic dogmatism that insists upon a simplistic reading of the Bible 
and a direct correlation to what the Bible says to the world without thinking about context and culture and about the world as we are living in today. Christians, how many of you have a spiritual father? How many of you have a spiritual mother? How many of you have gone as a true disciple of our Lord to speak to someone who is more knowledgeable than you in the faith? To ask them hard questions about how you live your life out in the everyday as a Christian? How many of you sit at the feet of the scholars of the church, of the church fathers of our age, the C.S. Lewis's of today, so that you might learn how to apply Christian values and Christian doctrines to the world that we live in right now? The example of the Old Testament teaches us that we should prize wisdom and therefore we should prize wisdom in those that teach wisdom. The church fathers are alive today. There are spiritual fathers alive today. Sit at their feet and learn. There are Christian scholars to learn from today. Sit at their feet and learn. Don't be proud. Don't be so filled with your own hubris that you don't think that you can learn. That, that you think you, you know all the answers. Learn from those Christians who are more mature than you. As Sheba learned from Solomon. So that's the first lesson that I want to talk about. The second lesson that I want to talk about is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading verses 1 to um, 11. When, a, when any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? Do you not know that all the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you in competent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels, to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases, then do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to decide between one believer and another? But a believer goes to a court against a believer and before unbelievers at that. In fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already, to def uh, already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud and believers at that. Do you know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now, think about the implications of what I have just read. The Bible is saying that rather than go to the civil courts to deal with civil legal disputes amongst the believers, the Christian church should have those who are wise enough, there's that importance of wisdom again, those that should be wise enough to judge between us in these minor affairs, in these civil disputes. The implication of this, if you think it through, brothers and sisters, is that we as Christians must behave like a legal entity unto ourselves. That we as Christians should not seek to be judged 
by the laws of the land, but by our own people according to our own faith in all matters that are of civil insignificance. I.e., if we're talking about paedophiles or we're talking about murder, obviously we go to the courts of the state. But if there are disputes between Christians that are civil in nature, we shouldn't be going and taking one another to court. We should appoint amongst ourselves those that we rec recognize as wise to make judgments between us and to settle our civil disputes outside of the world's view, not in front of the world. Now, what are the implications of this as Christians? It means that we as a community should value the wise. We should value those who have trodden the path of our Lord Jesus Christ and who have deeply reflected upon what his values and his teachings, what the Christian worldview looks like when it is applied in the world so that they can judge amongst us when we fall out with one another. Are you a Christian who is in a dispute with a Christian employer? Well, the scriptures say that you should go to those who are wise in the church to settle your dispute, not go to the civil courts. Christians, you say you believe in the Bible, so start acting like it. This requires, as Christians, that we are a people, that we are able to identify who are the wise, who are the wise amongst us, who are the ones who can judge between us. And it means that wherever we can, wherever it is right to do so, we should not involve the state. But this requires that as Christians, we live in close proximity to one another so that we can recognize who is the wise amongst us. It requires that we live lives with one another so that we can identify who is the wise. But it also means that we have to cultivate wisdom. It means that we have to value wisdom. So reject, O oh Christian, those who mock and laugh at knowledge and, teach and learning, those that diminish the, the scholar amongst us, those that, that diminish the fact that there are Christians who invested years studying the faith and seek out for yourselves the wise, those who know how to apply the faith in and have grown in Christian virtue. Because wisdom is the ap application of Christian values and Christian doctrines to our context today. And those Christians who have accomplished this in great feats in their own life, they are to be acclaimed as our fathers and our mothers in the faith. And when we dispute amongst ourselves on minor affairs, we should go to the fathers and the mothers that we recognize as wise to make wise judgments amongst us.